It does not work. Oh. My, oh, mine, okay. Hi! Welcome! Um, thanks for taking refuge from the sunshine inside this afternoon. The brief bits of sunshine. I'm Krista Wessel. I'm the morning host at uh, Portland's only classical radio station. All Classical Portland, 89.9. Good, I'm glad you heard of it. You probably heard of this guy, too. This is Carlos Calmar. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's so good to have you back in Portland. We've missed you terribly. Uh, well, I missed it, too. I was eight weeks on the road in, I think, six cities. I don't even remember. Uh, most of the time working. And it's just so, f so great to be back home. I mean, it's, it was about time. I, I was so fed up with being hotel and their hotel and uh, oh. <laughs> and also aside from everything to of being home and sleeping in your own bed it's also the fact that I am allowed again to work with our own Oregon Symphony which is my musical family and it's it's just very good to be there I want to thank you for hiring so many exceptional musicians in the last you've been here for 10 years now oh boy I'm an old happy anniversary well yeah getting there <laughs> <laughs> thank you you have hired so many exceptional musicians. I sat here last night and enjoyed this concert, and my jaw was on the floor. Some really great playing. Oh, there is some some amazing playing, and we continue. And uh, every time there is a new musician on stage, I'm thinking like, wow. Uh, but I mean, of course, I hired uh, I don't know how many, 28, 29 of the musicians have happened during this uh, 10 years. But I also you know what, I give very very big credit. The decision who is going to be hired is the decision of the music director everywhere, not only here in Oregon. And it's the responsibility of the music director to put his stamp and his vision there. But here in Oregon, whenever we have a musician apply for a position, we have an audition, there is always a panel of nine musicians who help selecting the person. Uh, technically, you can argue that they have nothing to do with the actual decision. However, the way we do things here in Oregon is after we, went, we go through all the audition process, we have an open discussion and everybody, literally everybody on this panel has their own say. Um, and I listen very carefully and uh, then I kind of summarize and uh, I say exactly what I think. And I would say that uh, if you think there were 28 uh, musicians that I hired, I would say that on 28 of them we agreed, the panel and I, and I would say on 26 of them we agreed 100%. And the rest of the two, we agreed, maybe only 85%. <laughs> we can live with that. So what I'm saying is this, in the end, uh, which I think is very important in terms of leadership, uh, you listen to the people around you. Because we're talking about experts in, the, in, in music. I mean, I don't know everything. And you put a, a, a trumpet player in front of me and, OK, I know how it sounds, but I'm, I'm, I don't know what they do with the lips. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's been really nice. On the weeks that you're not here, we do the pre-concert chats, we do the guest conductor, or often some of these musicians in the orchestra. And just as today's pre-concert chat is being videotaped, some of the concert conversations I've had with musicians have been videotaped and are on the All Classical website. So in just the last couple of weeks, Jessica Sindel, I interviewed her. Mm -hmm. Marty Ebert, our principal oboist. So a lot of the musicians you see on stage, you can go back and research at allclassical.org. Well, that is one of the great things that uh, actually we have musicians who can talk about the music that we play and who are very passionate about what, do, what we do. And I think that uh, that speaks uh, by itself for the for the interest also of the musician in the out outcoming product. Before we get started talking about tonight's concert, I want to mention all these microphones you see all around. Something exciting is happening. Yeah, this is this is not only a concert that's going to be broadcast as a whole in this wonderful 89.9 all classical uh, music station. Um, 
but we are also starting recording. The last piece on the program, the Walter Piston's Incredible Flutist, is one out of three pieces that are going to be the next recording, the third recording that the Oregon Symphony is doing uh, with me. I assume the end result will be out somewhere in October, November, give or take. Um, this time, because we realized, which is a coincidence, that um, the two other recordings that we did were very heavy towards English music, kind of fun. American orchestra, European conductor who is not English. Uh, I mean, English is not my first language. Uh, and then English music most of the time. And this time, it's American music. Walter Piston, next week we are um, recording Copland's Third Symphony and the Jazz Symphony by George Antal, so check it out. This whole concert, though, from top to bottom is fun, full of danceable rhythms, and has a really clever theme. I like the way you've strung these pieces together. Well, this is a program about circus and about a gathering con of people um, and people, let's say, celebrating the arrival, maybe, of a circus. Um, and lots of vendors in big places. And there is one exception, uh, which is the, the guitar concerto. The concerto for four guitars and orchestra, the Concierto Andaluz by Joaquin Rodrigo, is of course not, has nothing to do with the circus, but come on, four guitarists on a stage? <laughs> It's a circus by its own. <laughs> but uh, in, in the end, yesterday we were, after the concert, uh, our wonderful artistic administrator and I were talking about, is this too much of a kind uh, in terms of circus? And I said, uh, oh no, uh, it's not too much of a kind because you think circus and your mind goes in one direction, but trust me, you have uh, the piston, which tells you in, in its own way, although it's kind of only condensed music of what piston wrote. It's a ballet. And what you're going to hear is half the music that he actually wrote. It's an orchestral suite. And the real circus part is actually maybe four minutes of it. And the rest is what happens before the circus arrives and what happens once the circus is there and the flutist, the star of the circus, starts playing. The Petrushka, undoubtedly the biggest, by a long shot, piece in the program, is a story of its own. In, and it's, yeah, it's a very weird story. Although, uh, I mean, stories of puppets coming to life has been all over the map. And finally, the only piece that has circus in its title, the Circus Polka, it's uh, music specifically composed for a choreography in a circus for a dance of elephants. So there, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, not only elephants, but they choreographed it so that elephants were wearing tutus. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, it must have been one of those enormous circuses, Barnum and Bailey. And uh, in those days, uh, so 40s and 50s, last century, um, there was a lot of money being kind of poured into the phenomenon of circus. So Barnum and Bailey approached um, George Balanchine. But George Balanchine at that time was one of the, if not the greatest choreographer for classic ballet. In the last couple of years that I have been here, I uh, very often went to the shows of OBT and saw uh, Christopher Stoll uh, just recreating sometimes classic Balanchine choreographies. Amazing stuff that is still very valid today. So Balanchine got uh, a commission and uh, to write, to choreograph something with elephants. And he thought about what music can I utilize? So I thought, well, there is Stravinsky. Stravinsky is a little bit uh, musically crazy sometimes. So let's maybe approach him. So 
I don't know whether he picked up the phone or they met, but re the reports say that the conversation was something like, hi, Igor, I'm creating a new choreography and I need music for it, but the choreography is going to be a little uh, polka for elephants. Stravinsky said, are the elephants young? <laughs> Balanchin said, they are very young. And Stravinsky said, okay, if they are very young, I will do it. <laughs> Please figure out for yourself why they said, <laughs> never mind. So, Stravinsky writes this piece. It's a very Stravinskyan piece, meaning all the rhythms of the polka are there, but they are slightly off. Like it's, it's, and um, uh, storytellers say that the, the choreography was actually brilliant with uh, the prima ballerina called Motok, kind of starring. Motok was an elephant. Um, and it was 50 elephants in pink tutus with 50 ballerinas in pink tutus. And um, supposedly, at least the prima ballerina, Motok, did very well. Whether the other elephants really followed the rhythm, I can't really grant for that. Fact is, 425 performances. So, and uh, anybody who plays piano in this room and has played Schubert, uh, the military marches, you will, at the end of this little three minute 40 second piece, you will recognize Schubert being quoted by Stravinsky. Nothing ironic, it just came to him, that's all. It's a crazy piece, and it, that Schubert is a big musical surprise. Just as in the Walter Piston, there's a big surprise too, when the circus comes to town and the whole orchestra breaks into cheers. Last night there was so much giggling up in the audience. And the orchestra starts whistling and clapping and ha ah, It's delightful. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Um, in the score, it actually specifies the orchestra has to be cheerful during a certain part. So what happens is we are uh, in some village uh, and um, people just wake up from their afternoon nap and go about their business. And you hear a vendor here and the merchant's daughter setting up there and so on. And all of a sudden from the distant you hear a march coming and it's the circus coming to town. And when the circus literally arrives, what happened? This cheering and you think, why did Piston actually write that down? And the reason is when Piston this is again a commission. And Piston, when the first time had happened that he played this music for the dancers who were about to dance the premiere, they broke out in cheers. They were like, wow, great, fun, blah, blah, blah. And um, everybody was a little bit worried what the big, great Walter Piston would say about uh, dancers actually disrupting the wonderful music. And Piston said, Oh, this is great. From now on, I'm going to write this into my score. Every time we play this, cheers. So that, that's why it's there. When the cheers is over, you will hear this, the incredible flutist playing his, or displaying his, his art. And of course, the incredible flutist in a circus is what you expect, enchants snakes. But in this case, being in a small village, the the, the art of this flutist goes beyond that, and he not only enchants a snake or two, he enchants the merchant's daughter, and a couple of other couples, and there is love in the air, and uh, then uh, after two little dances, everything is very short-lived in this piece, uh, after a minuet and a waltz, uh, the clock strikes eight, and now comes the big gathering of the village with the final dance, which is a polka. And you can think that actually this final polka, it is kind of, yeah, it starts a little, I wouldn't call subdued, but it starts very controlled. And it's, yeah, it's a village dancing and having fun. But because of the power of the incredible flutist, 
thinks, and because there is love in the air, uh, things go completely crazy. And it gets very frantic, and with that, the piece ends. And The Incredible Flute is by Walter Piston, if we look at all the pieces on the program, is one of the more recently composed works, but it, that doesn't make it... Uh, the tonality is more romantic than modern, I would uh, say. Actually, I... Th I mean... Oh, boy. <laughs> Every time you ask me something or you put something historic on the... On, 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 a, on, on I am like, oh, what was written where? Um, okay, I, okay, it's very clear. Petrushka is the oldest piece. Uh, and then we get into trouble already. Because I think that the all three pieces are very close together. Maybe in the program I said, yeah. so I'm going not to make... Uh, the Rodrigo was written in the 1960s. Yeah, exactly. The Rodrigo is actually the newest. I think that the piston is before this, the circus. But the, the interesting point in terms of harmonical language as a whole is um, the, m the least modern piece is by a very long shot, the Rodrigo. I mean, the Rodrigo is actually such a fun piece of music, so accessible, the rhythms are so incredibly clear, there is not even like, be because I told you the Stravinsky Circus Polka is slightly off. In the Rodrigo, there is not a single note that is off. It's this is a bolero, this is a sevillana, this is a zapateado, all traditional dances from Andalusia, which is southwest in Spain. Um, and it would even be you could even imagine the Rodrigo, aside from the rhythms, being a piece that was written 1870, harmonically speaking, if this composer was, wouldn't have had the idea of here and there, rarely, to write one or two notes that don't match. So it's everything is great harmony with a couple of wrong notes. Rare. It's Rodrigo, and he does that pretty much in every piece that he writes. Also, the more famous um, uh, Fantasia para un gentilhombre, um, or even the Concierto de Aranjuez, his most famous piece. That's what he does. Everything is like, ah, oh, wonderful, and then like, really? And in this case, four guitars. So the oldest piece is the most modern sounding, Stravinsky's Petrushka. Yeah, the thing with, uh, just to get back at, the, at what you said about Walter Piston, it's true. The language is slightly romantic in... Um, I very often compare Walter Piston to the German composer Paul Hindemith, um, and the reason has actually not so much to do with their language. There is one similarity that I personally see, which is... Um, we are here confronted with a composer that really knows extremely well what he wants to say through his music and how to write it. There is no fuss. It's, it's just very clear. You, you do not have to think about what he means. What you really have to think about is how to convey it. That's really tricky. Now, the problem is that in both cases we are confronted with a composer who has a certain dryness in his way of writing. Um, I wouldn't call it academic, but why on earth is Hindemith not more popular? And what happened to Walter Piston, who in the 40s and 50s was one of the most played American composers here everywhere in the US? He won two Pulitzer Prizes back then. And now you look at programs everywhere in the country and where is Walter Piston? Pretty much nowhere to be found. And uh, so in, this, in our case, we went to the incredible flutist because as you've already heard, it fits very well this idea of circus and how to approach this, uh, this, this thinking. And one thing ha can be said, this is probably one of his most 
fun pieces. It's very approachable, and you, you, you will have a blast with it. I like what you did from stage last night, talking about Petrushka. Will you be doing that again today? Yes. Okay, because I see that we're running out of time for today's chat, and it's a piece that deserves some explanations. So there will be more from the stage tonight, but let's talk a little bit about the story of Petrushka and how it relates to the circus theme. Well, the story of Petrushka is actually... It happens all in St. Petersburg on the... Admiralty Square. And there is a lot of, again, vendors everywhere. And there is, and at the beginning, what you hear, and I'm going to explain it later from the stage, is um, you hear a lot of noises or music coming, and you hear a little musician playing hurdy gurdy and stuff like that, other people dancing. And then comes the point where so to speak, magician, a charlatan, steps up and ev gets everybody's attention and through his flute brings three puppets to life. And the entire story is about these three puppets. And uh, the three puppets are Petrushka, a ballerina, and the Moor. And actually it's a very humane, human uh, story because it's Petrushka, uh, an ugly little person, puppet, <laughs> the ballerina, beautiful, and the Moor, uh, who is just a little prettier than Petrushka and has way more money. So uh, Petrushka is very unhappy about the fact that he can't get the attention and love of the ballerina. The ballerina goes and dances uh, in the room of the moor and they get together and Petrushka is very, very upset by it and he gets chased away uh, by the moor and then there is a lot of dancing on this square and finally the moor is so upset that he pursues, he runs after Petrushka and strikes him down with his saber, and Petrushka dies. And the people are very upset seeing that, and they call the police. And the police comes and question the charlatan, and ch the charlatan says, uh, well, but those are puppets. What's the big deal? So, okay, everything dissipates, everybody goes home, the charlatan cleans up, it gets very quiet, and the last thing you hear is actually played by the trumpets in amidst this very quiet of the night settling on St. Petersburg. You hear very distinctive, very eerie music by the trumpets. And that is the charlatan cleans up his things and he sees on the roof of the next building the ghost of the dead Petrushka doing this at him and mocking him. Now, this is a key for the entire piece because, uh, you know, I had the tremendous pleasure of conducting uh, many times the three most amazing pieces that Stravinsky wrote. All ballets, The Firebird, uh, The Rite of Spring, um, and this one, Petrushka. And I'm always surprised um, by the how can I say, the reaction of the audience, because Firebird, wow, Rite of Spring, wow, Petrushka, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that has only to do, trust me, it has only to do with the ending of the piece, because the piece ends slowly and very quietly. And so it, there is no real effect and that's the entire reason, because the music is incredible. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a weird story, and the music is a little bit strange. Sometimes you will hear, and I told you the first time it happens, is the charlatan gets everybody's attention through drums. The drums sometimes in the piece have the role of, like in film music, you know, in film when you have a scene and there is cut, and something else happens, 
That's the role. It's like, cut the scene, let's go to something else. But the music is so incredibly colorful, so there are so many layers. So I thought, and you're going to hear it today in the afternoon, just before we start the concert, I will give you a couple of examples of what you will hear in the music, so you kind of can follow a little bit the storyline. Because I remember even uh, myself uh, listening for the first time to Petrushka and first not reading the program notes and second not really being able to remember what happens in the piece and I was after a while I thought great music I have no idea what's going on <laughs> but if you have a slight idea okay this is this and this is that you're fine then it's it, it, it's fine because you can ah yeah this is this is it. I remember Carlos told it, this is the dance russe or whatever it is. And then it works. And this is a piece, by the way, that uh, Stravinsky wrote in 1910, 1911. So it's barely over 100 years old. And it was right after he finished Firebird. So he was in his end 20s barely 30 years old, a very young composer, getting his second chance after the first uh, chance, the Firebird, was such a huge su success and Stravinsky was the talk of pretty much the nation back then. And um, uh, it was a second chance that was offered to him and it went a little bit different in terms of what happened in rehearsals because, you see, Firebird by Stravinsky is actually approachable music and fairly simple. Here and there, there is some quirkiness to it. This, Petrushka already signals to all of us what will come three years later with the Rite of Spring, which is completely crazy. And this is already in that direction. And therefore, the ballet, the musicians had a little bit of trouble figuring this out in rehearsal back then. On our days, this is a real great showpiece for an orchestra and you are really going to enjoy it. Well, are you ready for the circus to begin? Oh yeah, let's go. Thank you for coming. Carlos Kalmar. Krista Wessel. <laughs> 